Hey, this is Paul Cunningham, and I want to thank you for listening to our podcast. This sermon is a part of our Lenten series called One-on-One with Jesus, where we are taking a look at some of the conversations Jesus had with people in the Gospel of John. Thanks for listening, and as we make our journey toward Easter, I pray you are encouraged by this message. For more information about La Jolla Press, check out our website at ljpress.org or download our app. Well, good morning once again. We are so glad you are here today. Uh, If you are new or visiting with us, you have met us on a Sunday where we are in the middle and continuing a sermon series that Pastor Paul started called One on One with Jesus. And this is looking at all of the events and times and conversations where Jesus met individually with people on his entire journey through the gospel of John. And so today we are looking at Mary and Martha. And Mary and Martha is a terrific story. And many of you may think immediately when you hear Mary and Martha about a couple of stories. And this is a family that Jesus knew well and that he loved. And so as we begin this morning, I would just invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning and for the opportunity as we approach Easter. Lord, to remember all that you have done for us and all that are doing for us. And so, Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for this morning, and we pray that your spirit would be strong and speak to us during this message. We give you thanks, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, have you ever met someone, and I'm sure you have, I know I have, who could be described as someone who has a no matter what the circumstances I have faith in God. A person that no matter what tragedy or suffering or difficulty comes across to their life, they seem to remain faithful. And at times you may even think that they are in some sort of denial for the situation that is surrounding them, but yet they remain steadfast that everything will work out and that it will be okay in the end. And it doesn't matter about this present circumstance. There is more to come. Have you ever met someone like that? Someone who proclaimed this faith and you were kind of a little taken aback. What do you mean? Don't you realize what is happening in your life? And it doesn't matter. It could be a health situation. Something goes wrong with their body. They are hospitalized. And you go and maybe visit them. And they say, it's okay. I'm going to be okay. It's all going to work out. Or maybe they've had a financial crisis and we would all be terrified and scared and yet they have this faith that seems to be on bedrock and it's strong and secure and they have a peace about themselves. And you wonder, how are they going to get through this? But that's not the message they portray to you. They say it's going to be okay. Maybe it's a relationship has broken. Maybe it's a a matter of life and death, and they are on death's door, and yet they remain steadfast in this love and this peace and this confidence. And maybe you're actually even here today because you met someone like that. And you said, I want that type of peace. I want that confidence. I want that kind of faith. I don't even know what they mean, but I want that for my own life so that I can continue to feel okay because the reality is death scares me financial concerns scare me health scares me maybe it's other things that scare you and you've met people and somehow or another you ended up here because you said i want more of that and this is what they talked about well we're going to look at this story today with mary and martha but before we get there i wanted to explain a little bit of a big picture here Pastor Paul has been going through this sermon series, as I mentioned, and he's looking at all of these signs and wonders that Jesus is presenting to these people that are following him. But John, the the author, who's one of the original disciples, potentially the youngest of all the disciples, he's known as the James and John, or brothers. Sometimes they are given this word, the sons of thunder, That comes back from the time when some people weren't being super nice to Jesus and they came up with a brilliant idea to rain 
a horrible lightning, thunder, hailstones on this town. Wouldn't that be cool? And Jesus is like, no, just take a step back. We're not going to do that. And so John is this guy who was an eyewitness to everything that Jesus did, all of these signs and wonders. But he has an agenda when he writes this gospel that we have been going through. And I wanted to give you a sneak peek about what his agenda is because I think it's really important. And it's at the very end of the Gospel of John, and it's in John chapter 20. We're going to have it up here on the screen. And John chapter 20, he says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. And I sure wish they had been. Wouldn't that have been cool? But these are written, and this is his agenda for you today. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John's agenda is 100% that he was an eyewitness and he believed that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, and that he could have life in him by believing in him because he saw it all. He was present when all of these miracles happened. He saw the water changed into wine. He saw the official's son and heard about it being healed from a distance. He saw the feeding of the 5,000. He saw the paralytic be healed. He saw a man who had been born blind from birth healed. And he believed. But at some point in his life, he got to a point where he wanted others to believe, even though they couldn't be eyewitnesses. And so John did his absolute best to write down the most compelling, amazing stories that Jesus did so that you would believe. And that's where we're starting today is as Pastor Paul has been going through all of these events and signs and wonders to bring about belief, it starts to get close to Christ's resurrection. And so he brings about this amazing story of where he meets Mary and Martha, and their good friend Lazarus. And in fact, he doesn't just meet them. He knows Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He, he meets Mary a couple of times, and one of the times we know that this is the same Mary who came and pours perfume on Jesus' feet. He knows Mary and Martha from the meeting when he was there in their house teaching. And Martha was the one who was busily running around and getting all the food ready while Mary sat at Jesus' feet and learned. And we know that Lazarus is a brother and these are one family unit of siblings. And Jesus knew them well. And so we're not going to read all of John chapter 11. I would encourage you to check it out at some point. There's a pew Bible in front if you really want to do it now or you could do it later. But I wanted to highlight a couple of moments as we lead up to this moment of meeting Mary and Martha. And so what happens is that it starts out that Jesus is in another place. He's on the other side of the River Jordan. I know that's hard to picture, but it's a considerable distance away. And he receives a message and it says, it's from Mary and Martha. And he writes this message. And I want to put verse 3 up here. This is John chapter 11, verse 3. I want you to see this because he says something. They receive a message. And it says this. The sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. And I want you to just pay close attention to that. It's not some guy named Lazarus. It's Lord, the one you love is sick. And Mary and Martha knew Jesus well enough that they didn't say, come immediately and heal him. They knew who he was, of what he was able to do. And so they just sent a compelling word. Lord, the one you love is sick. Notice that he loved, they say you love the one you love, Lazarus. And so what happens is Jesus has this sort of strange moment after he receives the message and the way that John records it is he says, so Jesus stayed two more days. And there's an understanding and reasoning for this, but one of the reasons they say in uh, the book of John is he writes that they didn't go quite yet because he, Jesus wanted God to be glorified. And if you remember last week, Pastor Paul talked about this same moment when the Pharisees came and said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
And Jesus' response is neither. But he was this way so that God could be glorified. And so there's this theme building up that as it gets closer and closer, God is doing things, Jesus is doing things to glorify God. So I want to fast forward a little bit that we have verse 5 is the next verse I want to look at. And what happens is that Jesus is getting ready. He's still doing ministry, but he's getting ready to move back towards Bethany where they are. In verse 5, he's talking to the disciples and it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And I just put this up so you can remember this word that is occurring again, that Jesus loved them. And you would think that if you remember John chapter 4, as we were going through this, that the official son is sick. And Jesus heals him from a distance. Do you remember this? Pastor Paul just talked about this a couple weeks ago. He healed him from a distance. He said, go, your son will live. And everybody knew about this. This wasn't a small town. Everybody was beginning to follow Jesus. They wanted to know more. And so there's a hope. Well, wouldn't the one that Jesus loves, couldn't he just say it from wherever he is, Lazarus, you'll be okay. And suddenly he would be. There's a hope, but there's also a love that Jesus has for them. And so Jesus has this moment in this scripture passage where he says, let's go back to Judea. Now, Judea was the region that Bethany, where Mary and Martha lived, was in. It would be similar to saying, let's go to San Diego and we're going into La Jolla. But you just maybe say we're going to San Diego. And so he says, let's go back to Judea. And the disciples question him, Lord, the last time we were there, they tried to kill you. Why are we going back? And he says, we're going. And he says this funny word in verse 11. He says this, we're going our friend, because our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. Now the disciples, being very practical men, said to him, Oh, that's good. Lazarus is sick. He should probably sleep. The same thing we tell all of our friends and family when they're sick. What do we tell them? Get plenty of rest and drink lots of fluids. Right? The same thing we tell everybody. They're like, Oh, good. Lazarus is sick. He should get some rest, and they should probably follow it up. Drink plenty of fluids, too. Right, of course. Jesus, just send that message to him, right? And so Jesus says, guys, you're not getting it yet. Lazarus has died. But I'm going there to wake him up. So there's three things from this first part I want you to remember. Jesus loves Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And when Jesus refers to death, he calls it sleep. I want you to remember those. So let's now go forward to John chapter 11. And we're going to go through this meeting with Mary and Martha. So I'm going to put it up on the screen. You can read along. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I want you to just pause there for a moment and keep that on the screen. Martha hears that Jesus is now coming. He's close, and she runs out to meet him. And in this moment of desperation says, Lord, if you had not If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And I wondered, how many times have we asked a similar question in our lives? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, my mom would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, my family would still be intact. Lord, if you had been here, if you had shown up, My parents never would have been divorced, and I would have had a different life. Lord, if you had been here, I wouldn't have this health crisis. Lord, if you had been here, I wouldn't have whatever it may be. And we've all prayed that prayer. And we've had those moments of feeling, Lord, if you had shown up, and hidden in that question is a little bit of, Lord, don't you care? Why didn't you show up? I know I have had these moments, and I'm sure you have. 
where you have been pleading with the Lord. Maybe it was in a hospital bed. Maybe it was at home when the pain was the worst. Maybe it was in grief. Maybe it was in that moment of sadness when relationships were breaking. Lord, why won't you show up right now? Please, Lord. Please show up. We've all asked some variation of that question. And Martha is asking the same thing. Lord, where were you? Why weren't you here at the right time, at just the right moment when I needed you most? But Jesus gives potentially one of the greatest Christian answers that the world could ever know. And he brings about this gospel message, which is so great. And he says to her, oh, I'm sorry. He does say, Martha does have an amazing statement of faith before that, where she says, why weren't you here? But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Martha gives a great answer about what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. I know you will, he will give you whatever you ask. She realizes who she is talking to. And then Jesus responds to her and says, Your brother will rise again. And now in a great, both wonderful Jewish statement and Christian statement. This was both good. Remember, the Pharisees talked about the resurrection all the time. Uh, Martha says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. And that's a tremendous statement of faith. But Jesus begins to introduce this amazing moment that I think can meet every one of us. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Let's leave that up for a moment. So he says that whatever you do, Martha, don't forget that I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, even though they die, will live. And whoever believes in me will never die. And this is a tough statement because what's happening here is Jesus is both talking about I am the resurrection and I am the life. And so I want you to just get this for a moment. I am the resurrection and the life. And he says, the one who believes in me will live. And he's talking about the resurrection, that even though you die, you will live because he is the resurrection, that he brings life to those who have lost their lives on this earth. And then he says, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And Jesus begins talking about our eternal life with him. So he's talking about an earthly life that you can live even though you die, being the resurrection. And he says also at the same time, whoever believes in me will never die, meaning for eternity. And this is one of the greatest statements that Jesus brings because it's the hope and salvation that Jesus begins to share this new message for all people. And so what I like so much about this is I often tell our students here at the church that whoever can prophesy or predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, I'm going to follow that guy. And Jesus is now bringing and introducing this idea that he is going to predict his own death and resurrection. And then in two weeks, we're going to learn how he pulls it off. So I'm going to follow that guy. So Martha receives this grace statement and he says, do you believe this, Martha? And I thought about on the front of the bulletin, putting a little blank so you could write your name in there. But fill it in for a moment. Do you believe this? Mike, do you believe this? Right? And now, come on, that's good. We're getting yeses. That's good. That's a good thing. And so this is Jesus' absolute crux of everything leading up to this moment. But he knows at the same time, it's one thing to claim it, and it's another thing to show it and to live it out. And so here's what he does next. I want to just keep going through this passage of Scripture. Is that we're going to keep reading, actually, where we left off. Yes, Lord, 
which a lot of you, either in your heart or verbally, started to say. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. And so picture what's happening. Mary is sitting around with a bunch of other people, all who came out from Jerusalem, the Judeans. They all come down, and they are with her mourning and grieving the loss of her brother. And Martha comes and whispers into her ear, and she It says, the teacher is here and is asking for you. And I love the way that the Bible is written. We don't often get it in English, but I'm going to give you a little inside sneak peek here. After she had said this, oh, there you go, that's good. We'll go to the next one. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. You can't see this in English, but the word that the Apostle John writes in here is, she rises, and it's the same word, that is used for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After hearing that the teacher is here and is asking for you, she rose to go meet him. And so John knows what he's doing in presenting this idea that you get to rise when the teacher comes and asks for you. And the teacher is here asking for you now. I love that idea. So when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. She has a similar experience. Now, when Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That same question, the same heartache. And how does Jesus respond? Not with the same way he responds to Martha. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And so Jesus begins to walk with this group, including Mary, to the tomb where Lazarus is. And now we have John chapter eleven thirty five, 35, the most memorized scripture passage ever. <laughs> Jesus wept. But you know what I love about this? Is Jesus knows how to interact with each one of us. He knew what Martha needed. Why weren't you here when my brother died? Martha, you will rise again. I know when the resurrection comes. No, no, no. I am the resurrection, Martha. I am the life. If you believe in me, you will never, even though you die, you will live. And even though later on, if you believe in me, you will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe this, Lord. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the one who is to come. And with Martha, who could not bring herself to get up and run to Jesus in her grief, how does Jesus respond to her? He weeps with her because that's what she needed. Isn't that true of what Jesus does? He meets us where we need. And many people love this because it's the easiest scripture passage to memorize. A lot of people love it because it shows the humanity of Jesus. He was real. He was a man. He was, it was true. He was flesh and blood. But I also like to think about it that it also reveals about the divine, the deity of who God is. That somehow the tears, the grief of us people affect God. And ultimately what it is is that death affects everybody, including our Lord. And so he cries with them. I just love that he does that. Then it ends with this last little bit here. Then the Jews said, here's that word again, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Which I think is a great question that many of us face. See how he loved him? If he loved him, couldn't he have healed him and kept him from dying? Why didn't he do that? And that's where this ends. I would encourage you to read what happens right after this because it's wonderful and it's monumental. But that's for another day. So Jesus brings several things to people. But I wanted to start with this idea and this theme. Jesus loves four people in this story. He loves four people in this story. 
The first person that he loves is Lazarus. We saw that in the beginning. The one whom you love is sick. And when to Lazarus, Jesus brings something. This is a slight spoiler alert. He brings new life. He raises him him from the dead to show I have power over death. But he brings new life to him. He loves Lazarus and he brings new life. So one of the questions I have for you is where do you need new life from Jesus? Is there a bit of darkness or death that is in your life that constantly is present with you? That you return to often and you know you shouldn't? Anything from anger to gossip to things we shouldn't look at to activities we shouldn't engage in? The Lord says that's death. And is there new life that Jesus needs to bring to you? The second person that he loves in this story is Martha. And as he comes up to Martha, he brings something else. He brings truth. He brings a new perspective of Martha and to Martha. He brings this and says, this isn't everything. And, you know, I've worked with middle school students and high school students for so long that I always like to make sure people get this point. And so a couple years ago, we were at a summer camp, and I'm totally taking this illustration because I liked it so much. But here's what he says. He brings truth and a new perspective to Martha. So I have this little piece of rope here. And here's what he says. Martha, you see this here. This is your life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. This is our birth. This is our death. Anyone who believes in me, even though they die, will live. And then he says, but anyone who believes in me will never die. And so I went to Home Depot and I asked for an eternity rope, but all they had was a hundred footer, right? So I'm just going to throw it, right? I was going to throw it, but come on, we got communion. I'm not going to do that, right? Look. So this, again, they only had a hundred footer. I almost wiped out. Your life, even though you will die. The people that Jesus loves still have suffering and difficulty. They can get sick. They can die. Lazarus had to die twice. But the one who believes in me will never die. Should I go the whole hundred feet? Do you get the point? (laughs) But this again is supposed to be an eternity rope. It's supposed to be forever. That Jesus says, if you believe this, you will live and you will never die. So he brings that to Martha. Martha, this is forever. You can have it. What do you need in your life? Does Jesus need to bring truth to you? A new perspective? Have you been too focused on this earthly life? What else does he need to bring to you? That new perspective. Then Jesus goes and meets Martha, or Mary, whom he loves as well. He loves Mary. And what does he bring her? He brings her compassion. He weeps with her. He grieves with her. He comforts her. Where does Jesus need to bring compassion to you in your life? Maybe it's one of those. Maybe it's two of those. But then there's the fourth person that he loves in this passage. And that's you. You're the fourth person that he loves in this passage. Augustine, who's a famous theologian, says this. Simply believing in Christ, believing in Christ, places Christ inside you. For if there is faith in us, Christ is in us. And so... There is resurrection in us. And there is life in us. He loves you. Jesus came and he loves you and wanted you to experience life now and life forever. And that's why he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I saw this take place once and it was joyous. A man who had this amazing faith No matter what the circumstances, he lived for the Lord. And I was a chaplain in the hospital up in 
uh, Los Angeles. And I was on the oncology unit, which is the cancer floor. And I would walk up and down, and there was this one man who I hesitated to visit because he was in the last stages of life. He was heavily sedated, non-responsive, and was just lying there in a hospital bed. And I would kind of walk by, and this one nurse said to me, Hey, did you go and visit that guy? And I was like, Why? And she goes, Are you kidding me? Come with me. And this nurse takes the chaplain into the hospital room with this man. And he goes, You see this man? He loves the Lord. And he cannot wait for his entry into the new life that will never end. And even though this life now is ending, he can't wait for what is to come. And the next day, I came into the hospital and the man had died. And I walked by the room again and his body was still in the room and the same nurse, did you go in and visit him? And I was like, why? And she goes, come with me. And she pulls me in there and she goes, you know what happened here last night? And I go, well, what? And she goes, his entire family came and they smuggled pizza and beer into the hospital room because they were his favorite foods. And you know what they did? They had a party in his hospital room because hospice had called and they said, this is it. He's fading. This is it. And they threw a party and they drank beer and ate pizza in this man's hospital room, celebrating and ushering him into this life that will never end. What if, what if we lived like that? Would that be amazing if we lived like that? If we lived with the no matter what the circumstances, our life will be for the Lord because we have a hope and a confidence that this life, although temporary, That little tiny section over there is nothing compared to what Jesus gives us. What if we lived with the hope and confidence that we weren't ashamed or afraid or worried what people would think because we knew what was to come? Wouldn't that be amazing and wonderful if we could bring compassion to others the same way Jesus did? We could bring truth and perspectives to the way Jesus did. If we could bring life to the way, to other people the way Jesus did. Wouldn't that be amazing? And today, we get to celebrate that amazing with this table. Because Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, when he began to prove who he was and say, I predicted my death and resurrection, and I'm going to now begin to pull it off. On that night, Jesus sat with those he loved, his disciples. And he said to all of them, This bread will be broken for you. Translation, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to be broken for you. And anyone who eats of this bread does this in remembrance of me and all that I have done for them. Translation, Jesus has paid the price of our sins by dying on the cross. So every time you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of what the Lord has done. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant. Translation, if you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. If you confess your sins, he forgives them. If you turn to the Lord and have faith in him, Christ's resurrection and life enters into you. And so Jesus says, every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, do this in remembrance of me. So here in this church, we celebrate communion by passing first the bread. And we encourage you to hold that bread and do some work with the Lord. If you need to confess your sins, that's the time to do it. If you need to get right with the Lord and remove some things out of your life, that's the time to do it. And then when you're ready... We encourage you to take the bread and eat it. And then we'll pass the cup and we ask that you would hold the cup so that as a body of believers, we can all celebrate by drinking that cup together, signifying our unity in Christ. Let me pray for us. 
Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you so much that you are the resurrection and you are the life. Lord, that even though our bodies will one day die, you can give us life now. Lord, that we can live the most satisfying life by following after you now. And Jesus, we also thank you that you are the eternal life. Lord, that you have promised us that if we believe, that we can live forever. And so, Jesus, I just pray that as these elements are passed around, Lord Jesus, that we would remember all that you have done for us and what you are asking from us. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray all this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for listening. There will be a combined La Jolla Brass Hornswoggle concert on Sunday, April 14th at 4 p.m. in the Sanctuary. The concert is a brass tribute to John Lorgi, and proceeds from the offering will assist the Lorgi family with medical expenses. Don't miss this extraordinary concert. Beauty and love will abound. Our Monday Thursday Good Friday service is Thursday, April 18th at 7 p.m. in the Sanctuary. Join us on Monday Thursday for an evening communion service as we celebrate the Last Supper and prepare for Easter Sunday. Then, on April 21st, it's Easter. We will have four Easter Sunday services. At 6.30 a.m., we'll have a sunrise service at the Balboa Park Organ Pavilion. 8.45 and 11 a.m. are traditional services in the sanctuary. And then a 10 a.m. contemporary service in Fellowship Hall. Please join us for one or more of these four services as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We look forward to worshiping with you and bring a friend. You can find a complete listing of what's going on around La Jolla Press on our website at ljpress.org. That's L-J-P-R-E-S dot O-R-G. Or call the church office at 858-454-0713. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings, and we hope to see you soon.